Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar about how trains can take the strain in international goods movements and supply chains. Brought to you by the Institute of Export and International Trade in partnership with Hutchison Ports. My name is William Barnes Graham, the Senior Content Editor at the Institute, and I will be your host for the next 45 minutes to an hour or so. And I'm really looking forward to today's webinar as this isn't a topic we've covered before. So I hope, like me, you're excited to hear today's presentations. If we can move to the next slide, please. On the next slide. Thank you. Here you will see that we have two fantastic speakers today from both the Institute and Hutchison Ports. Later on, we'll be hearing from Kevin Shakespeare, the director of the Institute's Academy and a regular on our webinar program, as many of you will know. And before Kevin, we'll hear from Martin War, the Senior Manager for Strategic and Commercial Rail at the Port of Felix Day, who has over 30 years experience in the industry. And as you can see in this on the screen, is very involved in the rail industry. Um, so really delighted to have both Kevin and Martin here with us today. But we move on to the next slide and we'll have our first poll, which is our chance to find out a little bit more about you, our audience. So the first poll is going to ask, do you currently use rail freight? The options are never, occasionally, or frequently. While you're answering that poll, just a couple of quick housekeeping notes. Firstly, you can contact me with any comments or questions using the question panel on the control window to the right hand side of your screen. We hope to get to a number of your questions towards the end of the webinar, though please bear in mind, we, we do tend to get quite a lot of questions come through. So if you don't get to everything today, uh, then uh, basically have a look at our support afterwards. We have a technical helpline, training and consultancy offerings, which we, we, we will be talking about later in the webinar. So there'll be other ways to reach us. A tip on questions is if you can ask them in a succinct and easy for me to read way, um, that would be really uh, preferred. So yeah, try to keep it concise and clear. Secondly, you will receive access to today's slide pack and a recording of the webinar in a follow-up email we will be sending over the next day or so. So please do try to listen in as carefully as you can to today's presentation. You can also download the PDF in the handouts drop-down in the GoToWebinar panel. So I'm just going to close that poll in a second and share the results. So over half of you don't currently use well freight, about a third of you do occasionally, and just the 14% of you do frequently. So hopefully this webinar will be really informative for everyone on the call. But that's enough for me. On the next slide, it's over to Martin. So Martin, great to have you aboard and uh, looking forward to hearing more from you. So next slide, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Will. And uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, welcome to this um, uh, second webinar in the series. Uh, my name is Martin Moore, uh, Senior Manager for Strategic and Commercial Rail at the Port of Felixstowe. Uh, next slide, please. As you can see, this um, particular webinar is the second in a series of four, um, hosted um, jointly by the Port of Felixstowe and the Institute of Export. Uh, this, uh, as mentioned, this is the second in the series, and I'd like to share with you some details of the rail operation of the, at the port, um, illustrate the importance of rail to the modern supply chain, chain, and explain how rail can help your business grow. But first, some background. Uh, next slide, please. So Hutchison Ports is um, a member of the CK Hutchison's group, uh, which is a very diverse group, um, which is um, active in six core sectors. You can see the core sectors there. We have retail brands, which in the UK is the likes of Superdrug and Savers. They're also active in the energy sector. Um, in the UK, that's UK Power Networks. Um, infrastructure with Northumbrian Water and Wales, Wales and West Utilities, uh, Telecommunications, which is the three network in the UK,
finance and investments, and of course, the port sector. Uh, next slide, please. So it's, uh, we have a wide, uh, a worldwide um, network of, of ports. And as you can see, we are uh, very strong globally. We're handling in the region of 84 million TEUs per annum uh, with our network of 52 ports in 26 countries. In the UK, apart from the Port of Felix though, uh, the, the group also operates Harwich International Port and London Thames Port. And actually, Felix, though, was the, the group's first overseas acquisition back in 1991. So you can see that there's been quite a rapid expansion since that time. Uh, next slide, please. So just um, focusing on Felix, though, itself. Uh, we've been actually the, the number one container port in the UK for um, the best part of 40 years. And um, we're, we're twice as big as our, our nearest competitor. And about 40% of all UK containers pass through the port. And we're, in 2019, we handled just around about 4 million TEUs. Uh, you can see a, um, a picture of the port there with uh, our latest development, Burst 8 and 9, in the foreground with Trinity container, container Terminal in the background. Next slide, please. So the Port of Felix, though, is the largest single generator of intermodal or container traffic on the UK rail network. Within the, within the dock estate, the port owns and operates three intermodal freight terminals, north, central, and south, all of which are multi-user facilities offering open access to the freight operating companies. These terminals are equipped with a total of nine RMGs, that's rail mounted gantries, and container volumes handled by rail through the port have increased significantly in recent years, with the terminals now handling uh, between 10 to 12,000 boxes per week, which equates to approximately 1 million TEU annually. Rail volumes represent 29% of the port's domestic throughput and continue to grow. Currently, there are 74 services to and from the port daily, Monday to Friday, operated by Freightliner Limited, GB Rail Freight and DB Cargo in conjunction with Maritime Transport with these weekday services augmented by numerous weekend trains. These trains link the major markets of the UK with Felixstowe, providing direct connections to numerous nationwide locations. Next slide, please. So let's take a closer look at the three on-port terminals. We have the South Rail Terminal, uh, which dates back to 1973. Uh, there are three so-called working lines on this particular terminal, and we can handle 22 standard, standard wagon length trains on this terminal without having to split and shunt them. But of course, we are handling longer trains than that on a regular basis over more than one road. It's actually fitted with two RNG cranes, which were fully refurbished and replaced back in 2010. And they are from um, the, the Chinese manufacturer ZPMC. Uh, moving on, the, the Central Rail Terminal, which was opened in 1983 to complement the rapid expansion of the port and the development of Trinity Terminal, has seven working roads or lines. It can handle 24 standard wagon length trains without the need to split and shunt. But again, we're regularly handling longer trains than that on this particular terminal. And again, that's fitted out with two RNG cranes. The port's newest addition to its rail terminal portfolio, which opened in 2013, is the North Terminal. And this represented an investment of approximately 40 million, to, uh, 40 million pounds. The terminal has the capability to accept longer trains without the need to split and shunt over more than one line. And it boasts five rail mounted gantry cranes. It's also equipped with the UK's only loco traverser to facilitate terminal run round. Next slide, please. 
Although the dynamic is changing somewhat due to current market conditions, typically rail provides a cost benefit over road for distances in excess of 150 miles. As demonstrated by the graphic, the majority of the intermodal services to and from the port connect Felixstowe with the three UK geographical areas of the Northwest, the Midlands and Yorkshire, or the so-called Northern Powerhouse and the Midlands Engine. These areas, of course, represent the industrial heartland of the UK, and the rail links to Felixstowe provide the direct connectivity to the global markets. Uh, next slide, please. Felixstowe offers more daily rail connections to more UK locations than any other UK port. This slide illustrates the number of dif different destinations served. As previously mentioned, these are concentrated within the three main geographical areas of the Northwest, Midlands and Yorkshire, although you will also note connections from Cardiff, Coatbridge and Teesport. Uh, next slide, please. It's not just um, coverage which is important though. Uh, frequency of service is also important as it ensures regularity of flow and provides greater certainty. Here you will note numerous multiple daily departures from a number of locations to include Manchester, Birmingham, Widnes, Leeds, Liverpool, Hamsall, Birch Coppice, Rotherham, Iport, Rossington, Tinsley and East Midlands Gateway. Next slide please. I thought it might be useful to provide a brief overview of the current environment in which the UK rail freight industry operates and the main players with whom the port interacts on a regular basis. So starting at 12 o'clock on the diagram and moving clockwise, uh, FOX it is the acronym for the freight operating companies as opposed to the TOX, the train operating companies who operate the passenger services. There are currently five main FOX operating in the UK, Freightliner, GB Rail Freight, DB Cargo, Direct Rail Services and Colas Rail. Three of these five, Freightliner, GB Rail Freight and DB Cargo, operate daily intermodal services to and from Felixstowe, the latter in partnership with Maritime Transport. Network Rail owns and operates the UK rail network and infrastructure. It's a public sector monopoly business answerable to the government via the Department of Transport and currently runs the railway through five devolved geographical regions. There is a separate network-wide freight team which looks after the interests of the freight services which of course cross regional boundaries. The DFT. The Department of Transport is the government department with ultimate responsibility for UK railways. The department is headed up by Grant Shapps as Secretary of State and the minister with specific responsibility for rail is Chris Heaton Harris. Network Rail is regulated by the Office of Rail and Road or the ORR, the independent economic and safety regulator for Britain's railway. The ORR sets the targets which Network Rail has to achieve and, and reports regularly upon its performance. The Rail Freight Group, or RFG, is the representative body for rail freight in the UK. They campaign for a greater use of rail freight to deliver environmental and economic benefits for the UK. They have over 110 member companies, including train operators, end customers, ports and terminal operators, and suppliers, including locomotive and wagon companies and support services. The Port of Felix, though, is a long-standing and active member of this organisation. It's probably worth mentioning at this stage that the, the rail industry has just embarked upon a period of significant change. May this year saw the publication of the much anticipated Williams Rail, rail Review in the form of a white paper entitled The William Shapps Plan for Rail. The proposals set out in the review and are intended to form the biggest overhaul of the railway since the privatization of British Rail in the 1990s. This time around, a new central authority will be called Great British Railways, or GBR, which certainly strikes an optimistic tone. 
It remains to be seen what this actually means in practice. However, encouragingly, rail freight figures prominently in the review and it's been generally well received by the industry. Next slide, please. So what are the benefits of, of using rail? Well, certainly there, there is no doubt in the environmental credentials of rail, and indeed the carbon reduction benefits of using rail are widely recognized. Indeed, each tonne of freight transported by rail reduces carbon emissions by 76% compared to road, and each freight train removes between 43 to 76 lorries from the road, thereby alleviating road congestion and pollution. Consequently, rail is front and centre of the government's transport decarbonisation plan and has a key role to play in achieving net zero by 2050. Despite perhaps a, a poor reputation, largely it has to be said due to passenger train headlines, rail freight is reliable. In general, rail freight can match or better road freight reliability and freight trains continue to, to achieve higher speeds with heavier payloads as operators invest in better locos and wagons. The current contraction of the road haulage labour market has highlighted the benefits of using rail freight. Lastly, and, and quite importantly, rail provides scale. As container ships continue to get bigger, the latest largest contain, container ship in the world, the Everace, was recently in Felix, though at 24,000 TEU capacity. The number of containers of cargo being loaded and discharged at any one time also continues to grow. Obviously, these containers need to be evacuated and moved to the port as timely and effectively as possible. And of course, rail is extremely efficient in, in doing this. So these benefits together have combined to result in a growing demand for intermodal rail freight. Uh, next slide, please. So what does rail freight need to meet this demand and continue to grow? Certainly, network capacity is crucial. Just to explain, the majority of intermodal services from the UK's hinterland arrive at Felix Dovar two routes, either down the West Coast Main Line, across the North London Line, and up the Great Eastern to Ipswich, and then up the Felix Do branch to the, to the port. Or alternatively, via the strategically important cross-country route, or Felix Do to the North route, as it's known. The latter runs from its connection with the West Coast Main Line at Nuneaton far, uh, to Felixstowe via Peterborough, Ely, Hawley and Ipswich. It's widely recognised that this route is the key to providing for future capacity for intermodal freight. Whilst the branch line between Ipswich and Felixstowe has recently been upgraded to provide additional freight capacity, more on that in a second, Additional interventions are still required along the length of the FTN route to take full advantage of this increased capacity. As such, it's encouraging to note that the completion of further capacity works on this route are indeed a top priority for both Network Rail and the Department for Transport. It's probably stating the obvious, but it's uh, but a reliable network is required to ensure trains run to timetable. The reduction in demand for passenger services due to the pandemic has temporarily taken some of the strain off the network. However, network rail must continue to ensure the network remains robust as this demand returns. Interterminal capacity or inland terminal capacity, sorry, is, is also important, of course. And continued investment in these facilities is, is required to ensure efficiency of operation. I'm pleased to say that after a period of, of inactivity, we are now beginning to see both the development of new inland terminals, such as those recently opened at Eyport Doncaster and East Midlands Gateway, together with the expansion of existing sites. Rail freight also requires a cohesive 
cohesive coordinated national approach which overrides network rail regional boundaries as of course a typical freight train journey will pass through a number of different regions. Most recently network rail have achieved this with the integration of the freight team within their so-called system operator or centralized timetabling function. Uh, next slide please. Finally, um, an aerial, aerial view of an intermodal train heading to Felix Dovar, the Trimley Loop, the latest example of the continued investment in the rail infrastructure serving the port. Opened in 2019 at a cost of 65 million pounds, which included an 8 million pound contribution from Hutchison Ports. Uh, the, uh, the Trimley Loop increased the capacity on the branch line between Felixstowe and, and Ipswich from 33 to 45, possibly 47 freight train paths per day. Next slide, please. More information can be found by the Port of Felixstowe's website or the Hutchison Logistics website or via the Port app. It's also possible to subscribe to our to receive our regular publication for all UK shippers ship to shore. Alternatively, of course, we'd be happy to put you in direct touch with any of the freight operating companies operating out of Felixstowe, Freightliner Limited, DB Cargo, or GB Rail Freight. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Martin. That's a really interesting presentation. Great to hear so much more about rail freight and uh, particularly the Port of Felix Day's uh, connections to the UK's network. But if we move on to the next slide, we're just going to do a quick poll. Um, it's on the next slide. And this one's going to ask, how informed do you now feel about the port's rail offering and the rail freight industry in general? Options range from a little to feeling extremely informed and everything in between. Just while people are answering that poll, we've had a few questions in already. Thank you, everyone. A question from Harry, and it's kind of a question I want to ask as well, is, is about your thoughts on the planned changes for the UK rail industry and specifically the creation of Great British Railways. I mean, could you say a little bit more about what these changes are and kind of what, what your feelings are towards them? Yeah, well, it, it's it, that's an interesting question. Interesting times, actually, for the rail industry. And as, as I said in the presentation, um, uh, the government will um, create this this overriding organisation, Great British Railways, to to take full control of of the railways. Um, we're not not allowed, certainly, to to use the term nationalisation. I think the term is rationalisation. Um, but um, I think the rail freight industry is is quite encouraged by it. Actually, um, the William Shapps review was um, there, there were a lot of references to, to freight within that, and I think the government really gets it and they understand the importance of rail freight. And of course, it's front and centre the uh, um, in the objective of, of achieving uh, net zero by 2050. So I I, I mean. The, as always, the devil is in the detail, and um, but um, and and there's a, a lot uh, of work to get through before we see what the the um, uh, the final structure of this new organisation will look like. But at the moment, I think the the the, the feeling within the end within the industry is is, is fairly positive. Thank you, Martin, and I uh, hope that's been helpful, Harry, and, and everyone else who asked that question too. Just going to close that poll now and share the results. So 36% uh, of you feel informed but require more information, and for, for those of you, there will be a, a poll for which you can request that later. Uh, 20, a quarter of you feel adequately informed, 30% of you feel well informed, 9% of you a little. And I guess maybe this is a, an introductory webinar, so feeling extremely informed would be maybe a bit surprising. But um, yeah, thank you everyone for answering that poll. Really good to see that people feel a bit more informed than perhaps they were 25 minutes ago. Uh, but now, for now, I'm going to hide that poll. And on the next slide, it is my 
pleasure, of course, to welcome on Kevin Shakespeare from the Institute, who's going to talk about some of the cons wider considerations for traders to make. Over to you, Kevin. Um, and thank you, and good morning, everybody. And uh, uh, thank you to Martin for a, a great presentation, and it's an absolute pleasure to be working with the Port of Felixstowe. Um, rail freight is clearly um, an important area, and, and I think as we've looked at it, it's, it's, it's very much important for the future. So uh, I think it's important for everyone on 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 this webinar, if you're not currently involved in using rail freight or, or road freight, uh, rail freight, or you're in an advisory capacity, to sort of recognise the importance of rail freight. And, and one thing I think it's important, sort of going through Martin's presentation, is the sheer connectivity that rail freight can can give. And, and I don't think we're always aware of that. So if we have a next slide, please. So we're just going to go through a few slides now, which is uh, which is going to look at some benefits of rail freight, but also cover a few considerations around rail freight as well. Now, in in um, we don't always think about reliability when we think of rail freight. We probably think about our, our more our passenger experience uh, 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 as a passenger as opposed to rail freight. But it's important to recognise reliability aspect as well as the cost effectiveness aspect as well. So there are lots of investment in rail freight, uh, and and uh, and those investments will increase the actual cost effectiveness as well. And clearly, then there's the the environmental benefits which we've sort of talked around a lot, but just sort of position this from a business perspective. If you are a business who's importing, exporting, and using rail freight as effectively part of the supply chain and and as one of the modes of transport, there are really good benefits in terms of your message, your marketing message to, to your uh, to to your customers overseas. And also we have to position this against uh, the fact that rail freight is quite well known overseas. Clearly it's it's used heavily in, in, in the European Union and increasingly so in the likes of China, China to Europe. So rail freight has a, um, uh, has a growing reputation and increased uh, increase in awareness overseas. And that can be important for how UK businesses present themselves. And we know as the Institute, we're, we're, we're we're involved in a in in a number of projects globally, and 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 lots of learning around trade, freight logistics, and um, we just think about the sheer scale of uh, infrastructure investment, which is focused on rail freight, literally around the world, and the connectivity that rail freight gives. So, for example, from Tangier Med, free trade zone to Casablanca, uh, from uh, Miami, uh, Port Miami, uh, free trade zone, the links really really heavily used so businesses have this opportunity to engage uh, freight forwarders have the opportunity to get more involved as well so um, if we have the next slide please So um, when we think about the types of sectors that use rail freight, so who uses rail freight? So yes, shipping lines and freight forwarders, and we must emphasize the importance of um, using rail freight uh, linkage in terms of mode of uh, modes of trans uh, transport, intermodal, multimodal to actually use, the power generating companies, the automotive manufacturers, but also we, we maybe don't think of rail freight as much in terms of the major supermarkets and retailers uh, and, and, and the role of inland distribution centers. And, 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 and clearly Martin has referred to some key connect, uh, connectivity sources today, the fruit wholesalers, the whiskey producers. So for example, um, uh, uh, Scotch whiskey sent to large ports in the south of UK. And it's that connectivity and, 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 and clearly involving Port of Felix though, that connectivity to the global markets, the global markets present that opportunity and using rail freight as that connectivity uh, for both exports but also imports as part of the supply chain. If we have the next slide please. Now what we're going to do in the next couple of slides is, is, is refer to INCO terms but look at it in a slightly different way. So to, 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 uh, to actually look at INCO terms in the context of how rail freight connects with other modes of transport. Uh, yes, the principles of INCO terms are, can be applied to all modes of transport but just a few things I think to bear in mind here. So when you're quoting your INCO terms or you're negotiating the, 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 the actual international commercial terms of sale with your, with your suppliers and, and uh, overseas buyers, 
be precise in defining the named place. So, uh, so large cities, uh, for example, will have multiple business locations and ports may have several terminals. So you need to be very precise on the INCO terms. And it probably is better if you're a UK importer importing goods, certainly from the global markets, to have more control of the import formalities, the import customs declaration, uh, any licenses required, any specific certification. If you're dealing with a major global supplier, possibly not. But um, it is increasingly difficult for overseas uh, uh, suppliers to understand the requirements of the UK. We know that as the Institute, as we've held major webinars in the last couple of weeks uh, with, with uh, Australian exporters, New Zealand exporters, who are all asking us about what are the changes to requirements in 2021 post transition period. So sometimes it is better to have more control of the of the import formalities because your overseas supplier may struggle to understand both what it was previously, but what it is going forward. And obviously, uh, be very aware that the INCO terms determine the liability for customs declarations and licensing. If we have a next slide, please, we're going to look at a specific uh, two specific INCO terms, not the only INCO terms to use. Uh, see. CIMF and FOB. So um, I would stress obviously that they're not the only INCO terms to use. So some businesses could obviously use other INCO terms, CIP for example. But CIF, cost insurance and freight, there are some key distinctions here. And if you're experienced traders, experienced freight forwarders, intermediaries, you'll certainly be familiar with the difference. But there, but there, there are some risks here to, 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 to utilize in or, or benefits or drawbacks to certain INCO terms. So under CIF, for example, the seller, uh, the exporter pays the costs and freight and insurance to bring the goods to the port of destination in the overseas country. Whereas with FOB, which historically has been uh, certainly going back uh, years and years, has has, uh, has been a very popular INCO term, the, uh, uh, the the seller's responsibilities are different, and the seller loads goods on board uh, to the vessel, the ship nominated by the overseas buyer. So we can clear, we can clearly see some difference under CIF and FOB uh, as uh, as to where the cost. Um, uh, passes in that regard. And it's also important to recognize for FOB, it's not uh, not suitable for multimodal sea transport in containers. So um, when, when goods go on to a, a vessel, for insurance purposes, they should be visible to the ship's master. And if it's in containers, it's not visible. So actually claiming the insurance in the case of damage could be quite difficult there. But importers new to international trade may see CIF as a convenient way of trading. Just if you're trading with the European Union, uh, you may see uh, delivered at place DAP or or, uh, or or Xworks if you're the exporter as uh, as convenient. Whereas DDP as the importer, you might see as convenient. It's similar when we think about more more global routes and rest of the world with CIF. It's seen as convenient um, as uh, as as effectively a lot of the freight is not the responsibility of the UK importer. But what they must be aware, because the overseas uh, uh, seller is responsible for bringing the, uh, the, the cost of the freight and the insurance to the port of destination, um, uh, it could end up that the importer is paying more money because the exporter supplier adds a margin to the forwarder's cost. So it's something that, that certainly needs to be taken into account. And also just to end this topic on INCO terms, to be aware of the difference between CIP and CIF, who both have insurance embedded in the INCO term. So CIP now has a uh, as, as recommend, uh, recommended minimum insurance of Institute Cargo Clause A, all risks, whereas CIF remains at Institute Cargo Clause C. Which is uh, which? Okay, the the cost of cover is left, but the things covered uh, are, are are nowhere near as uh, as as high as under under Institute Cargo Clause A. So there's some factors to consider there, which should be aware of some of the nuances around specific INCO terms. So if we have a next slide, please. This will be our final slide. Uh, what we're going to just um, just go through here is is the uh, actual connectivity around supply chains and rail freight. 
So it's fair to say that rail freight is a key component of an integrated transport solution. So clearly, um, uh, as, as Martin went through, strategically situated warehouses, distribution centers. And, and you, you may have heard me before talking around customs warehouse and inward processing, customs special procedures. There's a key role that rail freight has to moving goods to the warehouse in under customs special procedures and as part of a duty mitigation strategy. And also we should consider multimodal approach to rail freight in terms of connectivity for e-commerce, which can include vans and bicycle careers as well. We don't necessarily tend to think of that, but in the rest of the world, in some parts of the world, it's actually quite big. Uh, and also rail freight allows businesses to participate in global supply chain. So uh, Port of Felix, though, for example, with its links to deep sea major ports globally, it allows UK businesses to actually access those global supply chains. Uh, if we have a next slide, please. So just by just by way of conclusion, um, just waiting for the next slide to come up. Um, we'll now move to a poll, but um, I hope you've enjoyed that. And I just wanted to bring out some key points on on rail freight. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, there seems to be a slight lag on the slides, so apologies for, for that, everyone. But um, yeah, as you can see, we're going to go into another poll, but we're also going to start asking your questions to the speakers as well. Uh, but I'll get this poll up initially. So this one is asking, uh, do you consider any of the following potential barriers to using rail freight? And uh, noted there are cost, ease of use, availability, awareness of offering, or none of the above. And you can select multiple of those options there. Right, so uh, while people are answering that poll, I'm just going to ask a question. Uh, this will be first for Kevin, but then I'll invite Martin to, to speak to this as well. Um, this is from Lucinda, who's asked, does the establishment of free ports offer an opportunity for rail freight? Um, yeah, no, firstly, very good question and, and, and I guess very topical as well. So I think the answer is definitely yes, it does provide that opportunity. Clearly, it, it depends on, on the Freeport operator and, and the actual customs and tax sites in the actual Freeport itself. But there is some great opportunities there in terms of those sites and locations to, to very much operate of warehouses, distribution centers, and links to links to industry. So the answer is definitely yes. And I know I can sort of speak from Freeport East, having lived in Stowmarket in the past, that there is great connectivity interview um, uh, opportunities just looking at one site. So uh, the answer is definitely yes. And if we look at the examples from the rest of the world, I've mentioned Tangier Med in Morocco, Port Miami, two to, to of the more successful uh, free ports around the world. There are definite opportunities there. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. And from a Freeport East uh, perspective, Martin, kind of what opportunities do you do you foresee happening as a, as that Freeport becomes a thing in the near future? Well, yes. I, I mean, I I would agree with uh, Kevin actually that um, obviously the the idea behind the Freeports initiative is is to stimulate economic growth and economic activity. And um, as hopefully I demonstrated in the presentation there, I mean freight. Uh, rail freight particularly intermodal rail freight is is well positioned at the moment to to take advantage of that so so yes um there are some definite hopefully some some definite uh, benefits to to accrue to to rail freight activity as a consequence of the freeport initiative but of course we we are still waiting for um some of the detail in in terms of the freeport um initiative to to come through so um um, and obviously, we, we've got a, a webinar on that subject uh, later on in this series. So, um, so uh, to watch this space. Thanks, Martin. And we'll be showing details for how you can sign up to that webinar uh, shortly. Just going to close the poll now and share the results. Thank you, everyone, for answering as ever. Uh, so, interestingly, tied there is availability of offering and uh, availability. Sorry, awareness of offering and availability. Uh, both 48% of you said uh, those were issues. Cost is up there, 
32% said ease of use uh, and only 8% said none of the above. Um, do feel free to comment in the question panel if there's any other uh, reasons which you'd like to uh, suggest to us as well. I mean, Martin, is that is that surprise the, the results of that poll? Um, no, no, I, I don't think it is actually. Um, um, availability um, is always, um, you know, can be an issue, particularly if you're only moving perhaps a, a small number of boxes. Um, uh, because obviously the the demand for rail freight at the moment is, is quite high. Um, awareness of, of the offering, that, that, that's an interesting one really, because I know the certainly the freight operating companies and indeed the network rail freight team um, hold numerous events to um, to promote rail freight. Um, uh, so, um, I mean, the information is out there, and, and again, I, I repeat the offer, if, if anyone wants to find out a bit more, um, you can either contact the freight operating companies direct, or indeed, come direct to myself, and, and I'll, I'll I'll do my best to, to, to either help you or, or put you in touch with the people you can. Thanks, Martin. And uh, actually, just I'll, I'll bring forward uh, the last poll, which is asking if you'd like us to share your contact details with Hydrus Ports because um, if you if uh, awareness of the offering or kind of more information about the ports is what you need to to view it as more of an option then this is a great opportunity to to um, have your contacts passed on so I'll leave that poll open for a few minutes as we do a few more questions. Uh, this will be one for you Martin we've had a few people asking around um, whether rail freight is suitable only for large bulk shipments or whether it can be used in a similar way to road freight. That's from Scott. Nick asked something similar. He asked, is rail freight as cost effective and flexible for part loaded less than container load shipments or is it um, more suitable for full container load? Um, well, obviously, uh, as far as um, uh, certainly we're concerned here in Felix though, we're, we're primarily or only involved in, in intermodal rail freight. So we're talking about um, either 20 foot or, or 40 foot containers, basically. Um, but as far as the, the, the bulk activity is concerned, um, the freight operating companies are also heavily involved in, in that side of things. And indeed, um, along with intermodal, the aggregate business is, is um, it is really booming at the moment as far as rail freight is concerned and that's very much a growth area. Part load is is interesting. Um, th there has been a, a lot of discussion recently about um, um, uh, sort of uh, resurrecting if you like um, parcel deliveries by rail uh, with uh, rail freight going into inner city locations and then on with distribution from there. Um, but there, that's in its very, very early stages at the moment. And um, um, there's limited activity in that area, but that is seen as a potential growth area going forward for rail freight. Thanks, Martin. I hope everyone uh, who asked that question uh, is satisfied there. We'll do another question while this poll is running. Uh, this is a question we got in from Catherine, who's asked if you can go into the operational uh, and cost trade and customs processes uh, of using rail freight and um, how these might be different for, from kind of other forms of freight. So she's noted things like packing of machinery, loading, offloading, uh, whether these could be covered. So Kevin, I don't know if you want to speak to Catherine's question first. Yeah, I'll 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 cover the sort of the customs elements of it. So I think when we think of customs, we have to think about when goods cross the border, which obviously can be by different modes of transport. So the actual customs procedures there are 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 um, are, are, are influenced again by the INCO terms as to who's responsible. But there is still the requirement for a customs declaration that doesn't change irrespective of the actual mode of transport. So the requirement for customs declarations and everything within the customs declaration, such as the origin of the goods, the valuation for customs purposes, the commodity code, etc., um, still 
still obviously apply. The other aspect clearly is the actual nature of the goods being moved. So when goods move from one frontier border to another, there may be specific certification and licenses required depending on the nature of the goods. But that more sort of uh, around how goods cross the border doesn't change irrespective of the actual mode of transport. Thank you. And Martin, anything anything to add, add to that piece, or do you think Kevin's kind of generally covered it? Well, well sorry, I, I kind of missed the question, to be honest, because my sound cut out temporarily. So, so could you re repeat it? No, it's at all. Uh, so it's from Catherine, who's asking uh, whether something could be said about whether the trade or customs processes um, differ for rail compared to other forms of freight. Oh, right. OK, well, I, I think I think. Kevin sort of uh, adequately covered that really I, I mean the answer is the answer is no the um, uh, procedures remain exactly the same regardless of the mode great thank you that's good to know so I think I uh, should have covered that question I'm just going to close the poll and you'll see on the next slide that we're very much in the Q&A uh, so let's do another few questions um, question in from Nick is asking around he's used rail directly from China to the UK before uh, without any issues he said the containers used to discharge from rail to road in Duisburg in uh, for, in Germany is this still the case uh, or does it now come all the way to the UK so I, I guess it's a general question around China to UK direct uh, freight links mm -hmm. is that to myself yes 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 please Martin yeah yeah, um, yeah, interesting development this, isn't it? Which is um, yeah, obviously um, been going a couple of years now. Actually, this this so-called land train from from China. Um, my understanding is that um, although there used to be uh, some connectivity by rail from the likes of Duisburg um, through to the UK, that's now ceased. Um, so that's that's not happening anymore. But of course, the trains are still running into Central Europe. Um, I, I believe there's a, also a hub at Hanover now, and then the boxes um, can obviously be brought to the UK by by other means. Um, I think um, I think the majority are coming over by short sea feeder uh, container ships from from Rotterdam at the moment. It's, I mean, it's a really interesting space in terms of the, the infrastructure being developed from China. So that's uh, definitely one to to keep an mm. eye on. Um, yeah, very much so. I've got a few questions around intra-UK connections. So uh, Laura asked, uh, does your Cardiff freight train connection stop via Bristol? And Scott has asked, does Eurotunnel Cope Bridge have good connections with Felix Day? Uh, um, well, so, yeah, certainly. I mean, the Cardiff train, I mean, the, the answer to that question is no, it, it doesn't stop at, at Bristol. It comes straight through to and from Felix though. Um, in fact, the, that particular train actually did used to go to Bristol, but um, the the operator on that route who are Freightliner actually switched destinations some time ago. Um, so, so obviously that's now a, a Cardiff um, origin train. Um, and the Euro tunnel to Coatbridge, no, um, that doesn't call at Felix though. We have a, a direct, uh, we have a daily connection um, to and from Coatbridge, but that's that's purely to and from Felixstowe from Coatbridge. Um, so it, we're not uh, involved in, in anything going through the Euro Tunnel at all. Thank you, Martin. Um, I'm having to cover for Will um, just in a second, but um, we have another question that is uh, coming to yourself, um, and that's uh, what is the main barrier to the port continuing to grow its rail throughput? Yeah, good question. That um, yeah, again, it, it has to be capacity on the network. Um, I think I mentioned in the presentation that the the branch line between Ipswich and Felixstowe has recently been um, upgraded, so we can get more and more freight trains up and down the um, uh, the branch line. But obviously, that opportunity has to be matched with additional capacity elsewhere. 
Uh, notably, I would suggest on the on the um, uh, cross country or Felix though to North route, um, which uh, still requires a number of interventions to to maximise the opportunity. Notably at Ely, which is quite a significant pinch point. Um, so that needs um, some significant interventions to to increase the capacity. Obviously, at the moment, the, the capacity on the network is somewhat um, uh, uh, somewhat uh, improved due to the uh, reduction in the passenger services. But I, I think the consensus of opinion is that, that uh, once this pandemic is, is finally finished, then it won't take long for um, uh, passenger de demand to, to come back to um, pre-pandemic levels um, uh, and, and obviously we need um, we need that capacity for freight. Um, HS2 will also help in that respect, um, not so much in, in regards of, of freight trains running up and down HS2 but what, what that will do is, is take some of the strain off the existing facility, the West Coast Main Line and hopefully open up more paths for freight trains on that particular route. Thanks, Martin. Uh, I'm back. Thanks, Matt, for stepping in on that question. Uh, just sort of sort of hardware issue there. Uh, so next question is from Jonathan, who'd like to understand the opportunities for direct rail services into Europe and specifically for dangerous goods transports. Uh, I don't know if, uh, I mean, Martin, do you want to try to handle that one or maybe pinpoint where Jonathan can look for more information? Yeah, um, you know, obviously you're talking um, Direct rail services obviously have to go through the tunnel. Um, as I said, I, that's not something we're involved with at the moment. And my understanding is that, um, um, as far as freight through the tunnel is concerned, that that's very underutilised at this moment in time. And I believe that's primarily due to cost. The cost of sending a train through the tunnel is is quite prohibitive. Um, so that's. Um, uh, you know that's a, that's an area which obviously has potential to, for, for growth, but but only if the um, the conditions are, are right. Um, uh, and the other part of the question was about dangerous goods, I believe, wasn't it? Yes, yes, it was. Yeah, not to uh, not to um, not really my my area of expertise, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but I can certainly. Um, act as a, a conduit and, and put him in touch with one of the freight operating companies who will be able to answer that question with a lot more certainty than I can. Thanks Martin. I mean uh, I don't know if Kevin's still on. Uh, Kevin, I mean, is there any advice you can give in terms of where people can find more information about moving dangerous goods? Yeah, I mean, with regard to to dangerous goods as a as as a, as a whole, businesses are, um, uh, there's two aspects. One is the moving of the goods, but obviously the requirement for businesses to have a dangerous goods safety advisor as well. So um, I, I think obviously businesses would need to look at the classification of the dangerous goods. What are they uh, in in line with the uh, uh, the UN United Nations Orange Book? Uh, and then they're not obviously liaise with a, a freight forwarding provider uh, to 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 actually see 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 what is possible. But first of all, check the nature of uh, of the goods. And and I appreciate that the question may have come from a business that already has a dangerous goods safety advisor. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I hope that's been helpful. Uh, and a question from Charlotte, who's asked, what is the process to get a container onto a train from Felix Day that has arrived by sea? Does it need to be booked before it arrives from the sea, or can it be booked once it arrives? Martin. Yeah, that's a very topical question, that, actually, because, um, I mean, the answer is no. It doesn't have to be booked before it arrives. But that would certainly help our, our operation if, if that could be the case. And in fact, we, we are talking to um, to all the freight operating companies in Felix, though, trying to get what's called pre-nomination information for boxes, which are on the, on the sea, if you like, heading towards us. Um, because if we know that those particular containers are actually destined to go by rail, um, we can actually put them in the most appropriate place in, in the container yard. Um, which obviously 
uh, negates the need perhaps for double handling and, and we can also limit the uh, the, um, uh, the running time between the actual container stack and, and the rail terminal itself. Um, so the answer to the question is uh, no, it doesn't have to be booked before it arrives, but that, I think that would help everyone involved if that could be the case. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, Charlotte, for the question. And I mean, Angus has asked maybe something which follows on, which is he's asked around what spare rail freight capacity is currently available at Felix Day Port. Um, I mean, I wonder if you can speak to that in a kind of a contemporary sense, but also more generally, kind of how, how much capacity is there usually? Yeah, well, interestingly, um, um, on, the, on the current services that we've got, the 37 in and out per day, uh, I mean, there, there is space. I mean, certainly the, the utilization figures that we've got are, um, I mean, reasonably high, but there, there's always there's always room for more. I mean, obviously some trains are more um, popular than others. Um, some trains indeed are actually um, uh, what's known as contract trains for, for a particular operator. Um, but there is um, a, an awful lot of opportunity for, for spot as well. Um, and we will actually hopefully be, be adding to our portfolio of, of train services very shortly, certainly before the end of the year. Um, so that will further increase the, the opportunities for, for rail freight. Thanks, Martin. And we'll do one last question. Uh, it's, it's something you touched on earlier, but it's from Gerard. How is support driving sustainability and particularly carbon reduction through the value chain, including its customers and suppliers? Well, um, yeah, well, we've got um, we've got quite a, a significant uh, environmental program ongoing at the port at the moment, which includes um, um, uh, quite a comprehensive electrification uh, program. Um, our rubber tie gantry cranes and also our our fleet of internal movement vehicles are all um, if they haven't already then um, scheduled to, to go electric within the next um, few years or so um, further information on that actually um, and there's an awful lot of detail around this can be found on the Port of Felixstowe's website, which is www.portofelixstowe.co.uk, where you'll find our latest in environmental report and also our most recent port air quality uh, strategy document. So, that, uh, as I said, there's an awful lot of detail in those two um, in those in in those two pamphlets, uh, which can be found online. The one thing we haven't mentioned actually is is electrification of the rail network itself, and um, Network Rail were here fairly recently, actually, because they're starting to look at um, so-called infill electrification schemes for the rail network. And certainly the Felixstowe branch between Ipswich and Felixstowe is very high on that list. Thanks, Martin. That's really interesting to see, to hear kind of how much is going on in that space. I mean, it's such a big, big area now. So that's definitely, uh, again, we will be showing the slides after the, the webinar, so you can find all the links mentioned there, but uh, also watch that space, because I imagine there'll be more developments in the years to come. But sadly, we have run out of time uh, for, for any more questions. So I'm going to have to wrap up now. Uh, for those of you whose questions we didn't get to, we'll, we'll try to... Uh, have a look through them in, in the follow-up and uh, hopefully if you've said you can be contacted by the port then they, they may be able to, to support you with those questions. Um, but thank you once again to Kevin and Martin for the presentations today. Really interesting, as noted at the start, it's not a topic we've covered before, so it's really interesting to hear about it. So thank you so much for all the insight and uh, details there as well. As you can see on the screen, uh, we do have some more webinars we're doing with Hutchison Ports or the Port of Felixstowe in the coming months. You can sign up to the next one about the impact of Brexit on goods movements, uh, particularly through the UK's ports. Uh, you can go to export.org.uk forward slash webinars for the sign up details. And further afield, you'll, you'll see we're running a webinar as well on the opportunities that free ports, including Freeport East, present to traders. For now, though, thank you so much for tuning in, everyone. We hope you found that useful, and we look forward to seeing you in the next one. Okay, goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.